five people need to go before we finish. Um, obviously, the main focus of it is not so much sort of individual conditions, but more about scientific integrity, research design, statistical analysis, um, and the systems that are, have been influenced by the research that's been published. Um, I've got one starter question. Uh, which is in very small print. So this has come from somebody watching on Facebook, uh, which is, could you please ask um, David the following question? Um, this is about the magenta study. Okay. Is that right? Mm -hmm. um, so the magenta study is a study uh, which involves young people, um, and it's run by um, Professor Esther Crawley, who uh, has been mentioned already, who's down in Bristol. Um, the study information leaflets to participants state, with reference to graded exercise therapy, that studies in adults have also not shown that there are any side effects from these treatments. Since informed consent was relied upon, the information leaflet and case trial acknowledged severe adverse effects with respect to graded exercise therapy. Without informed consent, are they allowed to publish the Magenta study results or use them in any way? So the question is basically this kind of uh, leakage of biasing information. Well, there's another, I'm going to have to, it, it, I, I haven't seen the consent forms for Magenta, so it's hard for me to comment on them directly. Um, I just say it's fun. if people don't understand, which not everybody will, because not everybody will have heard of it, so. Okay, so the Magenta yeah. trial is being conducted uh, through Bristol. Um, they have, they, they're in the middle of it. I'm not sure they're probably they've finished recruiting. It's, it's a, um, Professor Crawley is a pediatrician, um, and she runs the also the Bath Clinical Service, and she was until earlier this year the vice chair of the CFS ME Research Collaborative, and she left the collaborative, um, and somebody else is now the vice chair. After she left after her five year term, um, uh, I have been very critical of her work. She has publicly accused me of libel or li writing libelous blogs. Um, so the Magenta trial is a, a, a testing, uh, uh, you know, looking at, at children because she does studies in children. And um, yes, I, I agree that consent forms. Part of the problem is that the studies. Uh, have not shown, um, you know, the, 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 the consent forms have, it's very difficult with graded exercise therapy because the um, surveys show that more patients say that they're harmed than are helped. But surveys are not clinical trials and surveys, you know, people tend to write in uh, or respond to surveys who are more possibly more likely to report harms. If you did fine, then you're maybe less likely to report it. So there's a legitimate reason uh, to say that um, those don't prove anything. They prove that a certain number. And so just because a majority of people or more people say in a survey that they were harmed by graded exercise therapy than uh, say that they were not, does not mean that if you test, look at everybody, that uh, that would be true. Um, we don't know from anecdotal reports that people report that. If you talk to a lot of patients, they'll say that's what happened to them. But you may not be talking to the patients who got better, right? Possibly. Uh, well, that would be the that would be uh, how one would look at that as an epidemiologist. Um, in consent forms, you're supposed to provide full information. I do think that providing information from clinical from uh, surveys, since that is the best information we tend to have right now. Uh, uh, you know, is would be something that one would want to include in a consent form, um, or I would want to include that in a consent form if I was doing such a trial. And if it's not included in a consent form, I would uh, think that would be a problem. It doesn't seem like there's much barrier in the UK to publishing any of this research, no matter what the problems are. That doesn't mean they should be able to publish things, but it means that they can publish things because no one's really uh, doesn't seem to be very good oversight from research ethics committees and from editors, as far as I can tell. Um, in terms of, you know, the PACE trial said that there were no uh, evidence of harms. One of the problems with these trials, with the PACE trial, is that we actually have no idea if people were doing more 
I do, I have talked to part of, uh, you know, it, it, it is clear that some people were maybe walking more, but then they were not doing their laundry, or they were compensating for, so you're not going to get, if people are compensating for um, walking by doing less of everything else, you're not going to get measures of harm because they're not going to have done more. They're just going to be walking more, perhaps, uh, than other things. So the, the PACE trial or, and some of the other trials that might measure harms really don't measure harm or harms from activity. They measure whether people have reported some harms from the extras, the, what they're doing in the, in the trial, but not necessarily from all their activity and they may be reducing their other activity. Um, the other thing is that um, the, in the PACE trial, they also changed the way they were measuring harms from their protocol, like they changed many things from their protocol. And the way they changed it made it somewhat uh, harder to find that they were harmed. So, um, you know, but the other problem with the Magenta trial is that uh, it, it shouldn't be published anywhere in any event because what they did uh, was something that was also done in the Lightning Process trial. Um, which I bring about a lot, and I just wrote this about Magenta about a month ago, I guess I wrote a blog post, which, so, uh, in, in both of those trials, they, the investigators set up a, 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 what they call a feasibility trial, which is a, 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 like a pilot study that you do to see if something's viable, if it's feasible, if people, you know, accept the, 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 uh, uh, the treatment, and it, if it's possible to recruit people, and so on. So. Um, for the Magenta trial, they did a feasibility trial, and they said, we're going to see if this is feasible, and that was their main outcome, the feasibility, and they said, we're going to take, we're going to measure, you know, measure this, and this, and this, and this, but they did not pick which was their primary outcome, and what were their secondary outcomes, which is really the, the key thing. Um, after they included 100 people, they said, okay, now we're going to see if we can, normally you do a feasibility trial, and you figure this out, and then you do a completely other trial, to sort of test what happened in your feasibility trial, and you do a whole other group of people. What they've done now, at least as far as I can tell, at least twice at, at Bristol, is that they've taken the feasibility trial and they've extended it into the full trial, so they're including the feasibility trial as subjects in the full trial. The problem with that, and then, so they have a, a, an initial thing, and then they have a full trial registration, or in this case, they had the feasibility trial, and they sort of adapted that into the full trial registration. And then at that point, they decided, okay, after we've recruited, we've done these hundred people, now we're going to say that um, based on these findings, we're going to say that we think that the uh, physical function measure is the, is the primary outcome and the other ones are secondary outcomes. The problem for that is that all the journals, the major journals, have policies for now 13 years, since 2005, that they will not publish studies in which people were recruited before trial registration. That means that if you recruited people before your trial registration, and then you include those same people in the full trial, that study is automatic once you have your full trial registration. That study is automatically should be unpublishable in all the major journals. Now, when it comes to the lightning process studies, um, not only did they do that, but they swapped their primary and secondary outcomes at that point when they had already recruited 56 out of 100 people, and uh, a BMJ journal published in anyone. Um, I, I'm trying to get them to retract it because they've already promised not to publish trials like that. But Genta's in the same camp. They, even if they, so what, what happened was after the 100 people, then they have a full, they, they made the full trial registration, and then they recruited 120 more people. So 100 out of 220, almost half, were recruited before they established the full trial. By definition, even if nothing else was changed, by definition, the journals, that violates the, the policies of all the major journals to not publish trials which people were recruited before trial registration. There does not seem to be an exemption in that policy for feasibility trials and then you fold them into full trials. The other problem though is that if you then decide only after you've picked your 100 people, you've only gotten information from your first almost half of your subjects, and then you pick based on that, what's your primary outcome, that's, that's not a prospective trial. That's a, that's a trial where you bias your final findings by picking your primary outcome based on results of people who are in the full trial. It's kind of insane, actually, and it's not good science. It's not actually science, period, because you're basically biasing your findings, you know, whether intentionally or not, that's what you're doing. So I am 
making an argument that magenta uh, should not be published in any major journal for this very reason, because basically <coughs> they violated what's a core principle of all the major journals everywhere that publish medical research. Um, so I'm much less concerned about the informed consent part. I mean, I think that's a big thing, but the basic trial design essentially, from my perspective, makes it unpublishable in major journals. And I think that's a point that I need to keep making clear, and I need to make that clear to NICE, because that trial is likely to be um, published, perhaps, in the next couple of years, while NICE is considering this, uh, what to do about their guidance. So, you know, it needs to be made clear to NICE that this trial, you know, violates basic core principles, as I read it, of these policies. So. Thank you. Okay. Anybody got any questions that they would like to? Yeah. Okay, I'm a little harder for your <laughs> I'm getting my hearing. I can, I can, I can echo the question. Following the recent withdrawal of the supplement, do you think that's going to have an impact on the Toronto Center Women's Health Trial? So the question is, following the recent withdrawal of the Cochrane Review, well, so let me say one thing. It has not been withdrawn. They decided to withdraw it, and um, uh, you know, but it, that process was somewhat disrupted by the, um, uh, the, the, the coverage. So there was a <coughs> news report about it being uh, that they decided to withdraw. But if anybody goes online, it's still up there. So, um, you know, my sense is that that was done uh, by the uh, people who didn't want it to be withdrawn in order to sort of put, create pressure on Cochrane uh, by creating this, you know, not this fake narrative uh, that, they, that Cochrane was buckling under to patient, uh, you know, activist pressure, presumably from, you know, the same um, anti-scientific patients or climate change denying patients that have challenged the pace trial. Um, so, uh, you know, so the, the so it hasn't been withdrawn yet because normally you would withdraw something with the agreement of the people who did it. And so I think hopefully uh, it will be withdrawn. Um, I will you know, continue to do my uh, best to sort of see that that's happening. Um, so yes, assuming that that sticks, I think that will have, I don't know if that will have effect on the Lancet because the Lancet seems to be impervious to reality and <laughs> to common sense. Um, and to good science. So uh, I do think that will have an impact, uh, a very serious impact, because basically the, the Cochrane reviews are the last kind of defense. You know, nobody's really citing PACE as a, good, as a great, great trial anymore, except for, you know, seven people or whatever, or however number of people who seem to think that. But nobody's, you know, raging. I mean, I, I you know, I have an open letter with 114 experts. I don't see the letter with 114 experts defending the, the, the methodological um, anomalies of the PACE trial. I, I do see people coming out and saying patients are crazy or patients are hysterical, but that's not a defense of the science. That's sort of a, a, a non-defense and a non-response. And so I don't think that kind of defense is sustainable over the long term. Uh, I hope not. Um, and I do think that, the, it, you know, the the you know, Cochrane sort of reversal or apparent reversal um, will have an impact, certainly in the U.S., as, I mean, certainly in anybody who's trying to use Cochrane as a defense for PACE, because that's really the last thing. Nobody's really defending PACE. They're saying, well, maybe PACE wasn't a great trial, but, you know, uh, Cochrane reviews sort of ratify, you know, that it's the case. You know, the problem is if you're doing systematic reviews, which is what Cochrane does, are good, if the trials you're including in them are robust. If the trials you're including in them are also crap, um, then the systematic review is gonna be crap. And that's what's happened with Cochrane. The, review, the studies may not, the other studies in the systematic review may not have the egregious flaws in terms of outcome switching and other things that were done in PACE. However, they're you know, basically, uh, um, Subjective, you know, open, only online trials with subjective outcomes, and in the in the Cochrane review, they basically ignore, you know, all the objective outcomes that have shown that do not match the subjective one. So basically, they chose 
to do that review in a way that would exclude the data that would have been forced them to downgrade the, the quality, you know, the, 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 record, the, the, the findings, in, you know, downward in a negative way. Because if you included the objective reviews, you'd have to say, in PACE, they said, well, we're not going to pay attention to those objective reviews because they're not really, the, the results, because they're not really objective after all. Let's just focus on our great, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know our, our subjective outcomes. That's kind of like what they did in the review. So if they had included the objective outcomes, they would have had to have less good findings. And that's not, you know, again, they chose which things to review. And one of the responses of the reviewers was, when the criticism was made, was, well, that wasn't in the trial protocol, so why don't you work in the trial protocol? I mean, in the review protocol. The review protocol did not include the objective findings. It included the subjective findings. So that sort of begs the question, well, why weren't they included in the, in the, in the review protocol? Why was the group review protocol approved without any of the objective measures being, or without the objective measures in general being assessed. So uh, that's not really an answer to the question, but I do think that it's clear, and Cochrane has recognized, again, not because of um, you know, a, a patient pressure, but because what happened was these two very smart patients, Tom Camlin and Bob Courtney, wrote very, very extensive critiques, which are, anybody can read because they're attached to the, uh, the review. And the responses from Lilibet Laroon, who was the lead author on that, and a fan of cognitive behavior therapy and graded exercise, or I don't know about cognitive behavior therapy, but a fan of graded exercise therapy for this illness, um, basically gave non-responses. I mean, her responses were inadequate. Her responses were similar to the, some of the ones that I mentioned here, like about the outcome switching in pace. So Bob Courtney, uh, who unfortunately died earlier this year, um, filed a long complaint, a formal complaint with Cochrane, um, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, to investigate this, and apparently Cochrane decided that those um, concerns that had been raised by patients about the methodological and scientific missteps or lapses in the review were serious and needed to be responded to and felt that the authors had not responded to them appropriately or sufficiently. That was the reason for their, uh, their decision, not as portrayed because there was sort of activist patient pressure. And, you know, there was no reason. Cochran is under a lot of pressure for many reasons. I don't know if any of you are following it, but they've had a whole other um, crisis going on, uh, 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 totally unrelated, but related to the HPV vaccine, to an HPV vaccine review they did. So this was not something that they probably needed to take on. On top of that, they certainly would have been getting a lot of pressure, um, not just you know, from patients, but from the other side, who desperately wanting them not to, to withdraw it. And I don't see any reason why they would want to take it upon themselves to bring even more pressure on them from uh, the uh, ideological brigades for CBT, or the cult, the CBT, GDT cult, uh, uh, you know, uh, by, decided to withdraw the review unless they were really committed and really understood that this was a problem. So, um, yes, if it sticks, uh, and even the controversy over it now, I think, will make it harder to just say, oh, Cochrane, you know, the Cochrane, uh, 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 you know, decide Cochrane in support of these treatments. I have no idea what the Lancet will end up doing. Um, I ended up thinking, I, my retraction was my original goal, but I ended up just deciding that discrediting uh, these treatments as not based on good science. Again, not discrediting the treatments because, again, I am, you know, I, I'm tar I'm, I've targeted this bad science, so I think it's important to discredit the quality of the science um, because it's bad science. And um, so I kind of, whether the Lancet retracts it or not, I can't, I don't know. Uh, uh, I do think removal of the Cochrane seal of approval uh, will certainly impact whether these treatments are, how they're handled in NICE, how they are regarded going forward. Okay, thank you. Anybody else want to? Yeah? I can just add a little bit to that. Um, I know very well um, the director, I think he's the chief executive of the Health Trust. He was uh, director of the Health Trust in Derbyshire. He's now chief executive of the Health Trust in Scotland. 
And when I first engaged him in a conversation about the whole ME thing, he quoted the Cochrane Review to me as the gold standard. And I couldn't argue with that. This week, I sent that Reuters report to his wife, who I'm friends with on Facebook, and I said, put that under John's nose. Because that wipes away all of the arguments that they were quoting to me, which took the wind out of my sails with regards to everything else that I was saying in terms of all of the other science that supported the viewpoint that this is a physiological disease. Well, I think that's true. The problem is that the current prevailing narrative out there uh, is, is not about it being withdrawn because the science is bad, even though that is a reality, but that the, the, the narrative is that it was withdrawn irrationally and, and the harm, with harmful to science because of patient activists and so on. So it's that's a real problem, um, you know, but I think that I don't think that narrative will ultimately stick because I think when people look at their critiques, they can see the critiques are valid. As might be noticed, no one who's making that argument is actually arguing about, is it actually talked about the actual critiques. All they've talked about is patient pressure. Yes. Um, and so, you know, that's not, again, that's not a valid scientific <laughs> response to scientific critiques. Um, that's what the PACE authors have been doing now for a long time. They just cite crazy patients, crazy patients, um, and, you know, they, they can't argue the science, they can't explain because their explanations are preposterous and totally anti-scientific, the, the explanations they try to come up with for their methodological um, uh, flaws. And all they can argue about is it's crazy patients. I think one thing that's happened is that it was only crazy, crazy again, I, I'm sorry to say crazy, but you know, crazy patients from their perspective. I, I think that was likely they were able to do that until other people who outside the community and other scientists outside the, the you know, the the Charles Shepherds and sort of other few clinicians who understand what's going on, I think that was an easy narrative to sustain until three years ago. I think it's become increasingly difficult to sustain that narrative when we have open letters signed by, you know, mostly Americans, I have to say, um, but, you know, other scientists who are not in this field, but who look at the science and look at Pace and say, oh my God, this is really insane. Um, Something I found very sobering is that it's not the quality of your argument that counts. And you've been making this point time after time after time. The quality of your argument doesn't count. It's who you are. If you don't have any status, if you're just a patient, you're, you, you're nothing. Yes, I, I see that here. I think that's terrible. And I think, I think that's been a big problem. And I actually frankly think that a lot of it is, or some of it, I don't know, I'm not a sociologist, but I think that there is some, um, uh, I would say sickness, or maybe not sickness, but there's something about the culture of politeness and deference here that is very destructive in terms of getting actual evidence out. Because I think one of the things that, that's made me able to do what I do is that I'm, I'm American. I don't depend, I, I, I don't care about grants. I have no academic aspirations. I'm 62. I don't care about getting published in any of these journals. Um, I don't have to, I mean, I do have to worry, obviously, about having complaints to my university, but even if, I, I don't really care that much. And I don't, I don't depend on anybody here for health care. I don't depend on anybody here for status. I don't have anybody reviewing my grant you know, applications, but I don't make any grant applications. And even if I did, they wouldn't be being reviewed here. So I, I think that my gut is that they haven't been, they were not prepared, and they've sort of treated me like a patient. They sort of tried to make me look like a crazy person. And from their perspective, some of the things I do, I don't, I'm not normally standing up in front of crowds and tearing up papers. That's not my normal behavior. But I have noticed that it gets attention here, and uh, uh, it, 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 it sort of seems to be a way to have broken through. And because, you know, in the US, some of the things I've done would just be considered kind of performance art. Here, things seem to be shocking in a way that I'm kind of surprised about. And I, 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 you know, I, you know, and I think that they've they've not been prepared. I think in the beginning, when I started doing this, they made a lot of PR mistakes. Um, I think that they haven't been prepared just to deal with somebody who's not willing to play by you know, except for pa patients are stuck in a way. Um, 
but I think they probably haven't been prepared to deal with somebody who just doesn't care about that stuff here. I care about it more in the U.S., but not that much. Um, you know, I, 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 I don't care about it here at all. Just because somebody is knighted doesn't automatically make them somebody I have to respect or pay attention to uh, or, you know, be nice to. So I think, you know, they haven't been prepared so much for somebody not willing to act within the academic, you know, kind of parameters that they're used to. And I think they're a little bit... I actually had the impression, I don't know how... You're, I don't, well, you're kind of some of you my age. But, and how many remember when um, in Romania the Ceausescu fell? And there was that look when Nicola Ceausescu was giving his last speech. And in the back, someone was booing, or people were booing, and there was this look on his face of like total incomprehension. How could this be happening? Yeah. What is that noise? What are, I've had the feeling that they're kind of have been a little bit like that. Like they're just shell shocked. Now they're kind of used to it, I guess, but I think at the beginning they were kind of shell shocked. Like, you know, what's, what's going on? And I think they just haven't been uh, able to you know, cope with that. And part of the problem is that their science is bad. So I can come back and say, well, you can say this and then the other thing, but this is actually the case. And, you know, you know, I've been incredibly lucky. My colleague, Vincent, has been 100% supportive. Whatever I wanted to publish on Virology Blog, he's, I, I, you know, put it up there. Um, and as I said, if I was wrong, I would have been sued, and I would have lost my house or whatever. So, uh, you know, I think... I think they've been unprepared, and I think part of the reason why is because there is this kind of very bizarre culture here where you're not supposed to challenge people in this kind of way, and where people are scared to challenge people because they know that it might cost them something because these are powerful people. And they use that power effectively to silence people. I think with also within the population in general, there is an acceptance or an expectation that doctors are always right and you will always defer to a doctor and that we don't talk about things medical. It's somehow got this mystique about it. Well, I think that's also very different too because in the US you do challenge your doctor and a good, a good clinician expects you to come in and you know, ask questions and you know, it's sort of expected that, that there's an engagement with, with your doctor. I mean, if it's a good clinician and, and if you don't, the other thing is in the US, if you don't like your doctor, find another doctor, and it's not a hard thing to do. If, if, I mean, let's say we have a terrible, we don't have a healthcare system, so if you're lucky enough to have health insurance and good health insurance, I should, I should have that because many people don't. But I'm in San Francisco. If, my, if I'm gonna have my primary care doctor in LA, that's my business, it's not my insurance company's business, it's not anybody's business, it's my business. And if I don't like my doctor in LA and I wanna have my primary care doctor you know, in Hawaii, I mean, I have to go to Hawaii to see him or her or whatever, and my insurance company may pay a little less or whatever. You know, they have different networks and stuff like that. But it's nobody else's business but mine. And I think there's much more of a culture in the U.S. where you, you are allowed to challenge authority, obviously, where you're expected to challenge authority. And we do have a concept called academic freedom uh, where it's really not shocking to challenge scientists. I'm shocked here that... that what I do has been called harassment. You know, what I do has been, or when patients, you know, when, when these people, when they tweet something, then there's a lot of patients making very cogent and not, you know, polite, but firm points. It's harassment. You know, that they're, they're, I mean, I, again, I don't doubt that there has been, you know, that there's a lot of patients and people have all sorts of kinds of issues. So I'm not doubting for a second that some of these people have gotten really awful emails and so on that people should not have sent. However, I also have seen that they define freedom of information requests by de facto as vexatious, when as we've seen, the freedom of information requests have revealed that 13% of the participants were recovered for physical function at baseline, and they hid that information. They didn't provide that. So, you know, the idea that you're harassing somebody or that I can be called libelous when no evidence whatsoever has been provided that anything I've said is inaccurate, at least in this case, is in, I mean, you know, if it was, I correct things. If I write something that's inaccurate, everybody who's read my blog can see I correct it when it's pointed out to me. That's what you do, that's what you learn as a journalist. You don't even wait to be caught, you proactively correct things if you find out that they're wrong. So I have offered people you know, routinely to 
Send me your entire statement and I'm happy to post it if I've criticized you. That's what I do. If they don't want to take advantage of that, that's their problem. But if I'm going to be called libelous, there has to be some evidence that I've done something wrong. And if there's not, there should be repercussions for the person who's done that, or at least an apology or a withdrawal. Um, you know, and that doesn't seem to be operative here. It seems to be possible uh, uh, you know, to make these claims about people harassing and this and that without actually providing any evidence of harassment. Um, again, that's not to say that there hasn't been harassment or that there hasn't been uh, you know, activity of that ilk. But there is also, there does seem to be in addition to that, a very low threshold among this group of people for what they define as bad behavior. At least to me as an American, I will say that. Um, we have a we moment. Have see if we can get anybody else in the audience involved in the discussion. Is there anybody else with a question? Or, uh, Thank you. Thank you so much. Let me know who that is. Um, I will. Yes, I'll remember. Yeah, I'm just sort of wondering, sort of spreading it, spreading it out between the old the scientific example in terms of you know how do you start sort of shifting the political establishment and you know how do, how, how do we go about kind of moving this on okay we can wait and we can try and win the Cochrane fight um, but that you know but then there's the stuff around the nice guidelines um, there's and then there's the, the level of commitment within the UK to actually looking at the biometrical you know, element of this, which which you know it's there in writing, but it's not it's not there in practice. Well, I wish you know, it was. so uh, I think um, well, I think things that's happening slowly. So you do have. Carol Monaghan, who has publicly called it one of the biggest medical scandals of the 21st century, um, you know, which I think is a great quote that one can drop in, and I've used it in, you know, whatever, because once someone says that publicly, you can always cite them. And she's a member of parliament, and she has a physics degree or some kind of science degree or, you know, whatever, and she teaches science, or she was a science teacher. So she has some credibility, and she's on the Science and Technology Committee. So that's one person. But, you know, there is, I think, uh, and I, so it's sort of also a dialectic. I mean, part of my role has been, I think, to try to help get rid of the bad research so that there's more room for the good research. More of good research will further make it clear that that's bad research. So I mean, I think that as one, they're the, the <coughs> are operating at the same time. I think it's very clear, at least in the U.S. And I can speak more for the, so the U.S. You know, the, the the recommendations have changed. So there's. I think there's probably more, you know, doctors. I hear from more people like, oh yeah, my doctor, you know, has changed, you know, his opinion about it, or you know, I think there is slowly, but not fast enough, but slowly, kind of filtering out in a more general way. I have a lot of people saying, oh, when I say I work on this, they say, oh yeah, I've heard, I've, I've read recently that you know, they're finding this and that, and it's not. So I mean, I, I do think, of course, they've been saying that for a long time, and you know, so it, it, it is slow, and I think if you're a patient in that thing. It, it may be very hard to see any movement. So I see definitely a, a, some sort of shift, but it's a lot, I'm, I'm in a you know, luxurious position because I don't have any, so I can, it looks to me like there's a shift, but it may not feel like that, and maybe I could be mistaken, because I'm, maybe I see outward signs of a shift, but maybe things really aren't changing at a gut level. But, you know, I, so I, I think, there's not one way to do it. I think everything's kind of operating, you know, at the same time. And I think it's, there's maybe a few more members of parliament who start to sort of get involved. And um, as there's a little more biomedical research, and then if NICE comes up with better guidance, you know, which we don't know what they're going to do, um, or if they, you know, and, and if, if Cochrane, this, this decision sticks. So I think everything, and then if there's news coverage, so what am I, you know, uh, thing is to make sure there's news coverage out there, not just on virology blog, but you know elsewhere. So I thought it was pretty, you know, remarkable. I mean, uh, the Times, you know, I thought it was great that the Times had an article on this open letter. So it has to be balanced and that kind of thing. You have to have the other response from the other side. But the balance has changed because, except for the recent article about uh, yeah. Cochrane, 
you know, the coverage has been more, the coverage has before here, especially in the US as well, was sort of like scientists, eminent scientists against crazy patients. Now the balance, the, the, the framing is, this is an international scientific dispute at a high level. And that's how, for example, the Times covered the open letter recently, right? And how BMJ covered the open letter. That's a very different frame that people see than here's a crazy threat making patient and then, oh, the scientists work great studies, how can this be, you know, it's a horrible. So I think all those things operate in a kind of, you know, like a, like interlinked wheel. So one thing turns and there's another little turn and everything influences each other. So I think that's happening. But I think it's sort of hard to see because we don't actually have, I mean, the, 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 the thing everybody wants is some biomedical something that will get help keep diagnose people and then something that will treat them. So once that happens, the rest the rest falls into place. Until that happens, everything you have to work on all fronts. So I'm actually encouraged, but again, I'm not somebody who's been sick for 20 years and is desperately hoping for you know or a parent or whatever. So it's a luxury for me to say that, but I do think I see some change happening. Let's hope so. On this down the circuit of but uh, you have to accept it or not. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't have give us the knowledge and understanding that the power of understanding is nation appears to another person. So my idea when it is not accepted here, not accepted elsewhere. So I think today as by reality that I came and visited. And let's uh, hope that I get to just present my question. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Are there any other questions from anybody? Or is it, should we? Yeah, Bob. After the CMRC conference, have you now got a productive dialogue going with State, uh, Professor Holiday? How, uh, how, 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 did, how did you get a, a dialogue on the whole thing? Uh, no, no, no. <laughs> Have you now got a productive dialogue oh, yeah, right. with Professor Stephen Holgate? Um, I, you know, I've had more. I've had more uh, interaction with um, Chris Ponting, who right. replaced Professor Crawley as the vice chair. Um, you know, and again, I'm not. I I I um, am not a scientist, so it's hard for me. And I, since I wrote about that, it's hard for me to judge whether. The stuff presented there was robust research from a biomedical perspective. Um, it did seem to me that, um, you know, uh, I, I wasn't supposed to talk there. I was just, you know, uh, uh, I was there. You know, I was, I was, I was. You know, I, I said, "Can I come this year?" <laughs> and they were like, "Oh, great, come! Yeah, we're happy to have you." And then during the first day, they was like, "Oh, David, why don't you say say a few minutes about what you're doing?" So it wasn't like a planned thing. I just got up there and, you know said five minutes of things uh, and how shocked I was at the whole thing and how shocked I was at the MRC and why I wasn't there previously because I'd been accused of libel and was in, sort of in a war of words with both the organization and the previous vice chair. So um, Stephen Hovey was very welcoming to me. Um, you know, but I've had more dealing, more interaction with, with Chris Ponting, uh, you know, who's, who's kind of more in the day-to-day, -day, you know, running of it or the day-to-day -day kind of overseeing of it. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's what I'll say about that. Okay, just, um, I'm gonna wrap this session up now. I think there's an opportunity if anybody wants to go to the bar, if anybody wants to continue um, a conversation there, both are welcome to do so. Um, a huge thank you to everybody for coming today and thank you for everyone online. And um, uh, yeah, we've got another session tomorrow afternoon with, with, in a larger venue with a larger audience. I will um, say, I will say that um, I'm, uh, uh, I'm going to post something about uh, Cochrane tonight, so you can check online. Okay. Yeah, we'll certainly do that. And uh, yeah, an enormous thank you to Dr. Thank you. Thank you.